Annabeth Chase is a character from PJO, Heroes of Olympus, Trials of Apollo, and Magnus Chase from the Gods of Asgard. In this video, I'll share and break down her life in the first Ryordanverse series, aka the first five books of PJO. Originally, I wanted to make a video of her entire life in the Ryordanverse, but that would be a really long video to make, so I decided to break it down this way. Before getting into it, spoiler warning. And with that, let's get started. Annabeth was born to Frederick Chase, a mortal, and the goddess of wisdom and war Athena on July 12. Being the daughter of Athena, Annabeth wasn't born normally like other demigods, and instead, she was born as a brainchild and was made through Athena's thoughts. Athena gave Annabeth to Frederick as a gift, and she even named her. Annabeth appeared on Frederick's doorstep, and Frederick told Athena to give Annabeth to the gods in order to raise her there. But Athena refused, saying that mortal parents are the ones who raise demigods. Because of this, Frederick was forced to raise Annabeth on his own, and Annabeth would go on to take Frederick's last name, which was Chase. And that's how she became Annabeth Chase. Eventually, Frederick married another woman, and they had two kids together named Bobby and Matthew Chase. During those times, Annabeth would also get visits from her cousin Magnus Chase, who, unknown to anyone at the time, was actually a demigod son of Frey from the Norse gods. As a demigod herself, Annabeth was frequently attacked by monsters, and what made it worse was that she was the daughter of Athena, and this made her a target for spider attacks from Arachne. These attacks traumatized Annabeth, and she would scream and beg her father to help her, but nobody believed her because the evidence of the attacks cleared up when she tried to tell him. This caused Annabeth's fear of spiders, and the attacks made horrible fights between Annabeth, her dad, and her stepmom. One night, when Annabeth was seven years old, her cousin Magnus visited her family, and Annabeth and Magnus bonded as cousins. On that night, the adults of the Chase family had a huge argument that made Magnus's family never return to Annabeth's family. Feeling miserable and thinking as though nobody really cared about her, Annabeth left home at just the age of seven. During that time, Annabeth would fight monsters with nothing but a hammer and her mother's guidance. In her journey, she came across Thalia Grace and Luke Castellan, demigods who, like Annabeth, ran away from their home as well. Thalia and Luke quickly learned that Annabeth was a demigod, and they decided to make her join them. Luke came over to Annabeth and gave her a celestial bronze knife, and he got this from a son of Apollo named Hal, who told him that the knife would always protect the owner. Luke promised that he and Thalia would be Annabeth's new family, saying, You're part of our family now, and I promise, I won't let anything hurt you. I'm not going to fail you like our families did us. Deal? Annabeth agreed, and from then on, the three of them would travel and fight monsters together. On one occasion, Thalia was hurt pretty badly because of one of the attacks, and Luke was forced to bring her to his mother's place. There, Luke met Hermes for the first time, and from that meeting, Luke was never the same again. He became more reckless and wild, which Annabeth didn't see as a problem because during that time, she had developed a crush on him, and she saw him as her hero, which is just really sad considering what Luke does throughout these five books. Anyway, they eventually came across Grover Underwood, a satyr who was tasked to recruit demigods to Camp Haplod for safety. It was supposed to be an easier journey, but Grover took wrong turns and they ended up in a cyclops lair. Talia and Luke were trapped, and it was up to Annabeth to save them. The cyclops tried luring Annabeth in their trap, but Annabeth refused to be manipulated and stabbed the cyclops on the foot with her dagger. Which is a pretty brave move for a traumatized 7 year old, but Anyway, they managed to get out of there. On the downside though, Annabeth was once again traumatized by that experience, and that made her distrust Cyclopses from then on, which would also explain how she treated Tyson in the Sea of Monsters. After that, they were getting closer to camp, but Hades, who was mourning the death of Maria D'Angelo after Zeus killed her with his lightning, sent the most terrifying creatures of the underworld to attack Thalia, as she was the daughter of Zeus. While Thalia held back Hades' approaching army, Luke was forced to lead a crying Annabeth to Camp Hapblood. As Thalia was dying surrounded by monsters, Zeus took pity on his daughter and turned her into a pine tree so that she wouldn't die and be judged by Hades. Over the next years, Annabeth trained and lived in Camp Hapblood, and Frederick would sometimes ask Annabeth to come back to them via letters, but Annabeth refused. 
Annabeth was 10 years old when she first learned of the Great Prophecy, which is the prophecy that connects the entire five books. Chiron had told Annabeth that she would play a role in the prophecy, and she always wondered if the newcomer was the One, or the demigod of the prophecy. With this in mind, let's head to the events of the first book, The Lightning Thief, specifically when Percy Jackson entered Camp Hapblood. Annabeth wondered if he was the demigod of the prophecy. She would nurse Percy after his encounter with the Minotaur, and instead of congratulating Percy for defeating the beast, she said, You drool when you sleep. Annabeth would then explain to Percy about how he was the son of a Greek god, and how Camp Hapblood worked. After an encounter Percy had with Clarice, with Percy soaking Clarice in a fight, Annabeth was impressed by Percy's abilities, and she made him a member of her team when they played Capture the Flag. In that game sequence, Annabeth, being the war strategist she was, used Percy as bait for Clarice, and Clarice was distracted by Percy, wanting to get revenge on him. Percy managed to defeat Clarice, and Annabeth came in and witnessed it. Percy had a cut in his shoulder after that though, and Annabeth noticed that it was healing because of water, and that made Annabeth realize that he was the son of Poseidon. She was about to tell him, when a hellhound came running, Annabeth jumped in, but it went to attack Percy. After Chiron took it down, Annabeth instructed everyone to put Percy in the water to heal him. It was at that moment that Annabeth saw a symbol hovering over Percy, and it was the symbol of Poseidon, which meant that Percy was claimed. After Chiron explained the situation that Poseidon and Zeus were in, with Zeus's lightning bolt being stolen and Zeus blaming Poseidon for it, Annabeth joined the quest to retrieve it along with Percy and Grover. This was the moment when Annabeth started calling him Seaweed Brain, and the three of them started their first quest together. First, they were attacking the bus by Furies. Then, they had an encounter with Medusa, with Percy chopping her head off. Then, they met Ares and made them go to this love ride, which was actually a trap made by Hephaestus, which Annabeth hated to do. They went to the Lotus Hotel and got stuck there for a couple of days. And then, they met Hades, and it was revealed that Hades didn't steal the lightning bolt. Annabeth also witnessed Percy's fight against Ares, and actually protested to not do it, but Percy did it anyway. Then, by the almost end part of the first book, they all go back to Camp Hapblood. After Luke tried poisoning Percy with a scorpion, and the entire betrayal reveal that he made, Percy was passed out, and Annabeth was the one who nursed him back to health. Percy reveals that Luke was siding and working with Kronos, and Annabeth is hurt and heartbroken by this because the person she looked up to and loved turned evil. Despite this though, she admits that she's willing to fight and set things right, and Percy and Annabeth says goodbye, with Percy calling her Wise Girl, as a nickname against Seaweed Brain. Now, let's head to the second book in PJO, The Sea of Monsters. Here, Annabeth comes to Percy's school and helps him take down a couple of lace Dragonian giants. Percy meets his half-brother Tyson, and Annabeth, with her history of Cyclopses and the trauma she had from it, made her dislike and distrust Tyson. Percy didn't know what she went through though, and this creates a fight between the two of them. During this time, Thalia's tree was poisoned by Luke, and Grover had tried searching for the Golden Fleece to cure it. The problem was that Grover was trapped by Polyphemus, and Chiron was blamed for poisoning Thalia's tree. Tantalus then came in for Chiron's position, and ordered Clarice to do the quest in saving Thalia's tree. Despite the fact that Tantalus assigned Clarice to the job, Annabeth, Percy, and Tyson went on their own quest too. On the way, they came across Luke and were forced to escape the ship. Soon enough, Clarice Leroux found them and she let them aboard their ship. After this, Percy and Annabeth landed on Circe's Island, and Percy was turned into a guinea pig. Annabeth had to save him from there, and she had a huge makeover courtesy of Reyna and Hyla Ramirez Aureliano. After this, Percy and Annabeth exploded Circe's island, and they came across the Sirens, which are creatures who lures you to your death through showing what you really love. Annabeth wanted to see what her desire was, and she told Percy to get closer with the creatures. In it, Percy saw Annabeth's dream, a perfect family, with her mother Athena, her father Frederick, and a Luke who didn't turn evil. They would all be living in a city that Annabeth designed, because Annabeth believed that she could make a perfect world on her own, and that she could save everyone, which is her fatal flaw, hubris, aka deadly pride. 
Annabeth started to get more into it, and Percy was forced to drag her out of there. Annabeth broke down crying, and Percy held her as she explained her fatal flaw. Afterwards, they finally managed to reach Polyphemus' lair and save Grover. Annabeth pretended to be nobody, just like what Odysseus did in the myths. Annabeth and Percy entered a chariot race together and won. After which, Annabeth kissed Percy on the cheek in triumph. By the end of the book, Thalia comes back to life because of the Golden Fleece working too much, and the book ends there. Now, let's head to the Titan's Curse, the third book. In this book, Annabeth, Percy, Thalia, and Grover went to a school to pick up Nico and Bianca D'Angelo, who were demigods who needed to be recruited to Camp Hapblood. Things go terribly wrong when a manticore attacks to kidnap Nico and Bianca, and Annabeth helped in the fight. Annabeth jumped on the manticore to stab him, but this led to Annabeth and the manticore falling off a cliff, and she was kidnapped. Because of this, Annabeth was pretty absent throughout this book, except for a few dream sequences that Percy had, and that one encounter Percy had with Aphrodite, with Aphrodite looking a lot like Annabeth. Around this time, Annabeth held the weight of the sky, or the Titan's Curse, and she was able to hold it for quite a long time, which just says how powerful she is as a demigod. And then, we meet Annabeth again during the rest of the fight, and because of carrying the sky, she got a gray streak on her hair, which matched Percy's, as he also held the weight of the sky. Another detail about Annabeth that we got from this book was the fact that Annabeth actually considered joining the Hunters of Artemis, which, side note, scared the hell out of Percy. But anyway, she didn't join it in the end, probably because of the developing feelings she was having for Percy, and you can't date anyone when you're a hunter. And now, let's head to the events of the Battle of the Labyrinth, the fourth book. Around this time, Annabeth's feelings for Percy started to grow and become more prominent, but Percy didn't really see the signs. Percy and Annabeth were supposed to go see a movie together, when Percy was suddenly attacked. After it, he runs out with Rachel there, and this made Annabeth get annoyed and jealous. She started to act rude towards Rachel, but soon enough, Percy and Annabeth discovered the entrance to the labyrinth, and they realized Luke's plan of using it to attack Camp. In their quest in the labyrinth, Annabeth faces a sphinx, who gave some pretty easy questions, and Annabeth felt like it was insulting her intellect. Because of this, the Sphinx attacked, but they managed to get out of there. And then, they encountered some hellhounds, and Annabeth felt like they were both about to die. Because of this, she grabbed Percy's face and kissed him suddenly for good luck. The mountain exploded, and Percy was thrown to the island of Ogygia, or Calypso's island. Nobody knew where Percy was though, and Annabeth thought her best friend was dead. A funeral was made for him, and Percy himself attended it. Annabeth ran to him and hugged him, but after realizing that she was creating a scene, she pulled away. She soon realizes that Percy went in Calypso's island, and Annabeth got pretty jealous once more. During the Battle of the Labyrinth, Annabeth fought bravely along with the rest, and Camp Hapled won the battle. And now, let's head to the last Olympian, the fifth and final book. Annabeth meets Percy after Percy witnessed Bikendorf sacrificing himself and exploding Luke's ship. The two of them joined the rest of the campers for fighting for Camp Hapblood, and Annabeth used Plan 23 to send more reinforcements. At one point in the battle, Annabeth took a poison knife for Percy, and if she didn't do it, Percy would have died, because it would have hit his Achilles spot. While Annabeth was healing, Percy showed his Achilles spot and thanked her. The two of them share a tender moment, and in my opinion, by far one of the best scenes they have together. When Annabeth arrived at a battle alongside Percy, she soon realizes that she is the only one who could bring Luke back to them, and she tries to talk to him instead of fighting him, which is pretty much what Annabeth's strength is. I mean, she could fight pretty well, but she fights better when it comes to outsmarting the enemy instead of brute force. When she was knocked down to the floor, Luke was fighting against Kronos, and he was coming back to consciousness. Annabeth then said something that added the entire cherry on the icing to bring Luke back to them. She said, Family Luke, you promised. Which flashbacks to the thing Luke said when they first met that night. Luke had said, You're part of our family now, and I promise 
I won't let anything hurt you. I'm not going to fail you like our families did us. Deal? Annabeth understood the prophecy then, and this made her order Percy to give the knife to Luke to fulfill the prophecy. Luke killed himself, and the battle ended, and the only reason why Luke came to his senses to defeat Kronos was because of Annabeth. She was the vessel that took Luke away from Kronos, and that's the role she played in the prophecy. Annabeth would blame herself for Luke's death, thinking that she should have done something to prevent it from happening, as she's a daughter of Athena, and she should have known something better, which I don't really agree with, because I think that Luke brought this entire fate on his own. He chose to side with Kronos, and that's just that. After which, Annabeth became the architect of Olympus, and Percy was offered immortality. Annabeth was scared that he'd accept it, but Percy denied it after seeing the look on her face, which mirrors Percy being scared to death when Annabeth wanted to join the Hunters of Arnimus. They both celebrated their 16th birthday together, and they had the underwater kiss, which Percy described as the best underwater kiss of all time. The next day, Rachel announced a prophecy, which was the Prophecy of Seven, and the prophecy the Heroes of Olympus series would center around. Percy and Annabeth didn't pay that much attention to it though, because the great prophecy that had happened was announced a long time ago, and it took a while to actually take place. Little did they know that both of them were a part of this prophecy, and that it would start up a whole new adventure and more revelations about their world. So tune in next time for part 2 of Annabeth's life, which features what happens to her from the Heroes of Olympus, to Magnus Chase, and to the little bits and info we got from the Trials of Apollo. So how about you? Do you think that Annabeth should blame herself for what happened to Luke? Let me know in the comments down below.